Hey, everybody. I'm excited about our chat coming up with Sarah Payne. She was first introduced to medical marijuana during her treatment for stage three colon cancer. Cannabis is what got her through her initial illness, the surgery, as well as chemo. And today, she's an award-winning educator specializing in cancer-related symptom management and an activist for normalizing medical cannabis. <laughs> medical cannabis. I, I haven't even had a smoke yet, and I can barely say it. Anyway, we're excited about the conversation with Sarah Payne coming up next on the Michael Steele Podcast. Hey, Sarah, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here. Um, it's nice to flip the script a little bit. Last time I was in your neck of the woods, um, having to uh, uh, get grilled on cannabis by Sarah Payne. Uh, so, but it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. Um, it was very nice meeting you and, and, and getting a chance to, to chat about the industry, what's happening, where things are going. And um, and what what are some of the some of the big policy and and political issues, quite frankly, that you know many of the voices and, and leaders inside the industry are having to deal with? Um, let's let's kind of tell us a little bit about your story and in coming into this space, uh, which was which was very interesting, um, and and it'll kind of help help folks sort of get some grounding of where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And it's, it's always a treat to talk with you. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, if you told me 12 years ago that I would be working in cannabis, I would tell you you were nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I was working in downtown San Francisco, working in nonprofits, and a majority of my nonprofit work was in civil rights. Uh, when I was 37, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. And my mom is a cancer researcher. Actually, she just recently retired. She's mm -hmm. a chemical oncology nurse. So it was, she did the clinical trials on the chemo that I ended up taking during that time, like years earlier. Right. And because of her, I knew that cannabis would help me with, you know, nausea, you know, appetite. Although she'll say, I never told you to use cannabis. I told you <laughs> Mom, <laughs> I never told you to go to drugs. I just, <laughs> I just told you to go out in the backyard to grab some weeds. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And you know, one of the things that I noticed when I got my card, um, she was doing research in Baylor in right. uh, Dallas, and I went to go see her. And of course, you don't travel with cannabis, so I actually ended up taking a pharmaceutical form of synthesized THC with me to help me right after chemo. Cause I'd get unhooked, go visit her. And um, it was actually didn't work and it felt really awful. Right. And so cannabis for me at that time helped me to not have to take drugs that would create more complications with my treatment, which was wonderful. And it's not to say that I hadn't experimented with it before cause I certainly had, but I right. never did it medicinally. And then, you know, when you go through something huge like canna cannabis, cancer, you it changes the way you look at the world. Mm -hmm. And I had decided after my treatment that going back to the office wasn't the choice for me and that I wanted to go back to school, figure out what I wanted to do. I was going to go for my master's in org psych. And the dispensary that I work for now, actually, I became really good friends with the CEO because he, I wrote some letters to Department of Public Health on behalf of medical patients around policy. And so he asked me if I wanted a job and I said, sure, I'll stay with you for four years while I'm in grad school. And um, it's we're going on year 11. Ah. <laughs> and since then, um, I, I'm the public education officer for the apothecarium dispensaries, which are owned by Terrasend. And I have, I was the, one of the co-chairs for the legalization task force for San Francisco for three years. And now I'm on oversight committee. And I also am on steering committee for Americans for safe access, but my love is my podcast planted because mm -hmm. I get to talk to people like you mm -hmm. and people in the industry and really about all the different things, every, every different way that it touches it with an educational leaning because conversation is normalization. And when we're looking at policies now, it's wonderful that we're seeing legalization in a lot of states or we're seeing the, the idea that it may be coming to states, but we're still not basing policy necessarily on fact we're doing it on state culture, which is really strong. 
and stigma. And so now it's time for people to get educated, to get active. If there was ever a time to get civically act activated, it's now, and it's not just about cannabis, but it can be a really great way of teaching people how they can make a difference in their local and national government. So let's uh, uh, parse that a little bit because you, you wrote a great piece back in December um, about education in cannabis. Uh, and, and it was entitled, and folks, you can catch it uh, in Rolling Stone at rollingstone.com. Um, why cannabis education could create better policy. And you, you really uh, dive into two very distinct pieces of the cannabis discussion, um, one being uh, policy, mm -hmm. right? It's generally, okay, so how do we regulate this? What do we do with this? What is, and stigma, for example, where... Um, there are a lot of attitudes that are be have been around for a hundred years um, uh, in this space. You know, sort of a 1920s, 1930s view of you know uh, getting high and you know reefer madness, reefer madness, and all of that. And, and you you really try to bring into uh, clarity the 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 necessity for developing enlightened policies um, in a way that um, informs um, not just the policymakers, but the public, breaks down a lot of the stigmas. Talk about that because it is particularly important in understanding the, the policy differences between medicinal use and recreational use. And more states are now beginning to open the door to recreational use. And that's where you start to hear this sort of co-mingling of misunderstanding where they project their attitudes about someone who just wants to have a joint when they get home from work versus grandma who needs a joint to dull the pain or deal with issues related to pain and uh, health um, in, in her particular recovery regimen. Right, right. Well, there's... There's a lot to do around education for bridging the gap on knowledge to create good policy, right? I, I do, I do well, as somebody who has over 18,000 hours of experience with human beings and cannabis, I've seen the gamut with people using it medicinally, people using it just to kick back. Right. And we have to have a conversation about all of it. We, you know, there's, there's the idea of safe access for patients because people are actually able to use cannabis in lieu of other pharmaceuticals that could create more harm. Like in my case, when I was going through chemo. Right. And you've got people who should have access to safe, good product just because they want to relax. And there's, there's just a lot to be said in between both of those things. So if we have good policy in our states, everyone has access to safe product because the only time, you know, people talk about, you know, being a gateway drug. You and I talked about this on the podcast, right. you right. know, no one's going to be using cannabis and thinking crack sounds like a great idea. Let's <laughs> do that. You know? <laughs> no, they're not. They're not. And when we're looking at the recreational side as well, a lot of people and, and, don't get me wrong. I like a nice glass of wine as much as anyone. I'm very close, you know, I'm in the Bay Area, so I'm close to uh, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 so you do wine. <laughs> you know, but a lot of people have actually been able to curb their drinking, which has a lot worse side effects um, by using cannabis as an alternative for stress management. Because even when we're using it recreationally, whether it's called medicinal or recreational, it's a substance that creates a reaction in the body. And we want to make sure that we're educating the public to figure out what works well for them. Right. But also we want to be educating our, you know, our policymakers on the fact that if we don't have a good foundation for policy, we're not going to have safe product on the market and that cannabis has never killed anybody on its own. But what we have had is people with compromised immune systems getting cannabis off the market or in the black market um, because they couldn't afford it in the dispensaries and it could be rich in mildews, molds, funguses, heavy metals, pesticides, and with a compromised immune system that can kill you. 
And even if you don't have that, it's a harmful thing to be putting into your body. So we need to look at, especially in California, our taxation is so incredibly high that people are turning to the black market to get right. product. And in turn, the state is frustrated because they're saying, hey, we're not getting all the taxes we thought we were when we you know, created this taxation. And the bottom line is if we had lower taxes, not only would people purchase, but ultimately the government would be making more money because there would be more purchases in the legal market. Well, it's just amazing that here we are having a conversation about lowering taxes on cannabis. You know, it's just, you know, as a Republican who likes to lower taxes, I mean, that's, that's a space one would never think to find themselves. Uh, but it, it's an important space because it does speak a great deal to um, how markets are created in the first place and specifically black markets. And if you want to avoid that as a, a long-term underground problem, then you have to strike the right balance between what the market can bear in terms of tax uh, on, on, on cannabis and, and, and govern or not govern, but place that policy in, 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 in the proper place and context with the voters out there and with the people who use it so that they will, so that they will actually, as you say, participate in that market. Because otherwise, I'm not, if, you, if you put a 300% you know, tax on something, guess what? I'm not using it. No, I'm just going to go someplace. I'm, I got, look, I got Bobo in the back who give me a hookup when it comes in the warehouse and I'll just get it from Bobo. I'll slip Bobo 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 50 bucks. Um, and I can get it, uh, get what I need. So the, you know, you make an excellent point about that, that understanding of, of how these policies, when they're implemented actually play out. Um, and how they also inform the public, how they um, may play a role in educating the public in the long run. Um, what, what would be a proper uh, form of cannabis education in your view as, as states are now looking, looking to broaden this conversation as we are here in Maryland, they continue to do in places like California, but as we now see in the deep south, uh, in in the Midwest, the same move in this direction. How would you how would you look at those types of policies and and uh, connect that education dot for, for for people out there? I think that education not only has to happen in the form of public education, where we're looking at you know, working with Department of Public Health and putting together educational programs or just even, you know, ads that they do for education. Um, but the big problem, the disconnect with that is that a lot of times we're not getting appropriate education on the policy side or on the public side because they're worried about getting biased information. So you have to really look at who your educator is. Like, me with my education, my work with policy, I don't have skin in the game. I'm not looking to make a lot of money by selling a product and giving people information so that they purchase that product. Mm -hmm. I'm having conversations about everybody reacts differently to cannabis. Let's create a safe container for experimentation and let me show you how. Let's do the basic conversations on the different ways of using cannabis, how it metabolizes in each individual's body, and also looking at talking to companies about, let's not say that this is a calm formula because for right. somebody, it could be something that makes them a little crazy. Like when we were talking in my podcast about having that Tylenol moment, we right. have to talk about all the good things that happen, but also the things that we need to be careful about because cannabis is not a panacea. And a lot of the work that I do with policymakers is really cutting through all of that and having real talk because- an unfortunate part of my work is there are some people that are really excited about cannabis, but they fail to understand that there are things that we have to take into consideration. And even though we create our own endogenous cannabinoids in our body, we have an endocannabinoid system, not all of us can tolerate phytocannabinoids, which is what we find in cannabis, like THC, CBD, all right. of that. And talking about drug interactions and talking about the fact that, you know, as with anything, we're walking 
chemistry experiments as human beings, and we're all really different. And I also think that having the conversation with policymakers about the human side of cannabis, how it's affecting people, how it's creating jobs. But here's something for you, Michael. We talk about all the jobs that cannabis has created for people, getting people working in, getting people engaged in things that they may not have even considered. Young people are looking at things like supply chain management, right. culture, biochemistry that may not have before. But when they get these great jobs, they don't qualify for an FHA loan if they want to buy a house. Right, right, right. Exactly. Because the federal government has not caught up in its policy uh, with respect to this, this product. Uh, and uh, not just how to regulate it, but tax it um, and integrate it into the economy, um, the banking system, et cetera. So you see those realities. As we are, as we, you know, one of the things you and I talked about um, when I when I visited Planted, the 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 idea that you've got again this the medicinal rec, recreational use, you've got these uh, ideas about both of those um, right. right now. Why do you think these stigmas and these has and this hesitancy at towards cannabis persists? If you see it play out, you hear members of Congress talk about it as if you know it is is some foreign thing from another world unbeknownst to man and woman you know that you know will harm and kill and devastate communities when we know the science tells us that's not the case but there is this stigma there is this hesitancy what what do you think attributes to that well Hearst Dupont and Anslinger did a great job with their work turning people against cannabis back in the day. And the thing that we really need to talk about, and some of us are, I actually, I do for Black History Month, I always do a class on cannabis history because it really talks about how a lot of these policies were racist. Mm -hmm. they were looking to target a particular you know, group of people. And then you have people like the DuPonts who hemp was actually, um, you know, it was going to compete with plastics. And then we have our own William Randolph Hearst. Right. Who, you know, he was into lumber and hump and hemp was, you know, going to definitely compete with that. So right. what we're looking at was competition and racism because the AMA. That's, and that still seems to be the order of the day today. Yes. yes. <laughs> still and very the, much at the core of, of the cannabis uh, discussion. That's <laughs> competition it. And, even, and racism. Yeah. And even though, we, like I said before, it's not a panacea, a lot of the issues that we're having with the environment, with industrial things, would have never happened had we been using a lot of hemp products. Like, I don't know if you know this, but like Henry Ford had a car that was made from hemp. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. These, these are the issues that we deal with. I mean, our Declaration of Independence, one of the drafts was written on hemp paper, not the declaration itself, like some people like to say, but one of the drafts. It's been an integral part of our country for years as far as industry and also the things that we used it for, for medicine. And now people are coming back to it. And they're having these revelations like, oh, it's good for this. Oh, it's good for that. Well, guess what? A lot of people knew that a long time ago before we went into prohibition. So how do you how do we now today we, we like to think of ourselves as much more enlightened than our forefathers and mothers, forebearers, and um, certainly on subjects like this uh, we we tend to look through a somewhat distorted view uh, lens rather uh, at times um, where we only see certain things and not the entire picture and that's particularly the case when looking at um, the issues around uh, race and how that is a, a play in, in the industry, not just among those um, that are now trying to grab up licenses and things like that, but even among the indus industry itself and how they um, have over time dealt with uh, some of the stigmas related to race inside uh, the cannabis community. So what, what do you think both the community as a whole and policymakers who are shaping this policy should or can be doing to um, begin to address the, the levels of, of 
discrimination, deal with the social equity component that everyone is now uh, hyped up on, but really not so much because as we're seeing play out, not, a, not every brother and sister is getting it. And, and a whole lot of folks are still in jail for having an ounce of weed, um, you know, uh, yeah. a decade ago. So how do you see those pieces as you talked about in your, in your op-ed about bringing, you know, the education uh, and the policy piece together? How do we do that in this sort of discrimination, social equity space? I think what we really need to do is acknowledge the fact that education has been held back in a lot of these communities. People haven't had the opportunities to learn about, go to B school, I mean, get your MBA to be right. able to learn, you know, horticulture. A lot of these people haven't had the opportunities to to have the privilege of education that a lot of us have. So we need to, uh, and this is, you know, I, it's one of those phrases, level the playing field. We need to start creating opportunities for people to get scholarships and to have, like I taught one of the first cannabis classes at City College, that's an accessible institution for people to learn. And then, you know, go from there, support equity brands, like really go vote mm -hmm. with your wallet. People need to go to dispensaries and ask about equity brands. And also, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of equity brands I think have a hard time getting into dispensaries because people are looking at things through the lens of privilege where, you know, people are looking at the branding and everything. They're like, oh, that doesn't look like me. That doesn't feel like me. Well, guess what? People of color, yeah. black people want to see products that represent that. That represent, and, and it's true most anything. So I was going to, that, that sort of begs the question, how, do, how does the equity, the social equity uh piece play itself out in cannabis. Um, I mean, why does it seem that in some regards, the people you would think most likely to get it don't seem to get it? Why do, why do black and brown people have a really hard time getting loans for anything? Yeah. I mean, there's, we are seeing more companies. Sort of the systemic nature of the way institutions are created and then sustained longer term. Yeah. And when we're looking at some of some, there are some equity participants that have been very successful and have been really lucky to link up with wonderful people. We have some amazing activists out there doing a lot of the hard work and I really applaud them. And we have people that are trying to get a foothold in equity, but we have people who are being predatory with them, larger companies that are saying, sure, you know, I'll support you but I want 51% of your company. Right, right. And right. then all of a sudden they find themselves locked out of their businesses and out in the cold. So we have to close those loopholes as well and figure out ways for people to be able to be sustainable, to have access to resources that aren't going to turn on them. Right. And also having the conversation about generational wealth and how to create assets that can be passed down from generation to generation, because that's something that in many ways is lacking in these communities. I mean, when we look at like San Francisco and what happened to the Fillmore and people getting their houses taken away from them by eminent domain, those were things that they could have passed on to their families that could have been used as equity to start businesses. Yeah, 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 that, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And it really kind of, it, it begs for me the next question then, because is this really something that policymakers can foster and promote to help reduce discrimination and, and sort of uh, address the social equity piece? Or is this something that becomes uh, a practicum in the industry itself, where by virtue of a general mindset, an ideology, if you will, and practical application and, and, and engagement, the community is the one that will set that standard. So you have a choice. We can, as a community in the cannabis space, begin to address holistically and directly systemic racism and, and social inequity in our industry, such as it is growing, or we can wait to be told how to do that by, by state and federal policymakers. I think it's both. I think we have to start here and now in our, our community and in our industry mm -hmm. and make change. 
And I think from a policy standpoint, it should happen as well. Like in San Francisco, you know, we have to participate in some way, shape or form in equity to get our licensure. And we have to report on it every year. And I think it's something that we should really be doing because we should be lifting each other up as a community. Right. And I think that, you know, there should be more things around training, tax breaks, fast tracking and permitting for equity businesses, but also getting the community involved with mentorship programs and helping people with their brands, because we have a lot of, we have a lot of really talented people that are coming from the black market that need to get other skill sets that they may not have had access to. Right. We have a lot of privileged people in the cannabis industry that have a lot of access to not only education, but connections that they could actually help because networking and education are what it's all about being able to succeed in this, right? It's, it's not always what you know, but who you know, but in cannabis, it should be both. Like we should be having people, you know, you have a problem with working with like metric, you should be able to talk to somebody that will help you through it because it's a headache for everybody. If you have somebody who wants to start a business and they're looking to get funding, there should be some sort of way, like we have incubators that are helping with that. Right. Like how business plans and where to go for grants and even like on the oversight committee we've been talking about the grants in california that are going out to equity businesses and one of the things that we made as a recommendation was that the equity operator needed to own 51 percent or more of their business to get the entire amount because otherwise we're giving that grant money not just to the equity person but to somebody who could actually screw them over we're having a great conversation with uh, Sarah Pan. She is uh, an award-winning educator and activist uh, in both the, the cancer and the cannabis space. Uh, we're going to continue our great conversation after this quake break. Quick break. Quick break. Quick break. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to Michael Steele Podcast. I am Michael Steele and enjoying very much um, my reconnect with Sarah Pan, who is um, uh, really, uh, she, she's not uh, your, your typical af- activist, per se. She's really honed in on the, on the education in the cannabis space and making people aware uh, of, of so many aspects and feature of the industry as a whole, the products, the science, uh, the biology, uh, which, you know, a lot of times we, we kind of look at these things, Sarah, and it's all, it's all one shot. It's all about the cash or it's all about, you know, uh, the restrictions that the government will put on it. It's all about the taxes. It's all, but what I appreciate about what you are doing and what you do with your podcast, she's the host, by the way, of the podcast Planted with Sarah Payne. Um, which I appeared, by the way. So check out my appearance on her podcast as you listen to her appearance on mine. Um, but you you really try to you really try to square it out, you know, to sort of let's let's figure out where the four corners are here and and really begin to understand what we're working with um, when as this industry is growing. One of the things that um, we talked about on your podcast and that I made a tried to make a pretty big deal about when I was at um, um, a cannabis convention a few years ago, um, uh, Arcview was this, the idea of the responsibility the industry has right now to bring the American people along in this process, to make sure that people understand um, that this is not, you know, an industry of potheads who don't give a damn about children having access to uh, cannabis or, um, you know, pushing out uh, propaganda uh, for the sake of raking in cash. Uh, That's not been my experience in talking with enlightened and intelligent people like yourself who are are steadfastly, um, you know, making the case in front of policymakers uh, about, about the industry. How do you, where do you see it right now uh, as more states are coming online, people, as we noted, are you know, starting to evolve into people, states, into recreational use? 
Um, where do you see the industry right now in the, in the mind's eye of the country? I see a lot of people really excited and I see a lot of people really nervous. And what I always say to that is, I use the hashtag conversation is normalization. Right. Because people, when I've talked to people, whether it's a policymaker or a member of the public, what changes their mind is having a conversation with somebody else to see the impact that it's had on their life. Whether it's the cancer survivor that used it um, to get through their ordeal, or they have a family member or a friend who started a cannabis business and they start to understand, oh, there's so much more to it than I could ever possibly have thought. Right. Because we're, it's, it's about stigma. And, and also, you know, we're getting some good studies that are coming out, especially around stuff with like youth access. The thing that we hear the most when we're looking at, you know, policy is, you know, what about the children? And, you know, on oversight committee, we have somebody from the unified school district down there. So we, we have these conversations. Right. And what we're finding is that in areas where there's legalization, kids aren't interested in cannabis because all of a sudden when it's, a, you know, when it's legalized and they know that their aunt or their parents are partaking, right. it's no longer fun. It's no longer something that they shouldn't be doing. So they're feeling, you know, curious about it and doing it. And the fact of the matter is that when we have, you know, established brick and mortar, you can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come into the store, very much obviously a senior, doesn't have their ID and gets so mad that we can't let them in. And it's like, yes, right. I know. I know. <laughs> I know you're a senior baby, but it's like it's like when you go to a restaurant and you order at certain states, certain restaurants, you order booze, you got to show an ID. Yeah. And and I'm sitting there at the table, I'm like, do I look like I'm under 18? And the hostess or the waitress or waiter just laughs and goes, no, what's your ID? You know, you, you get it. I mean, I get it, grandma, I get it. But you need the ID to get in the store. So, but that's, what does that say though about the, 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 the social consciousness of those proprietors and, and those in the industry that they're not willing to take the risk and let grandma in the store with in violation of state law that requires that they check her ID when she comes in. Um, now, I'm not a, I'm not a numb nut. I know nothing's absolute. And there's someone out there who's skirting the, the rules and the laws and, and not doing it the right way. But I, and it's kind of, Sarah goes to, I guess, the one of the you know the falsehoods and the myths about the industry that may still persist today that these are people who are on the wrong side of the law by virtue of the product that they sell or the product that they use how do you how do you address that and how do you beat back on those falsehoods what are some of the falsehoods that still exist about cannabis today but well one that there hasn't been enough research done on cannabis Cannabis has been used for thousands of years. <laughs> thousands of years. I mean, <laughs> folks, cavemen use cannabis, okay? <laughs> the moment they figured out, once they figured out fire, cannabis was not far behind. <laughs> it's true. Well, and, and what we're finding is that as far as cultivation, that may be one of the earliest things that we cultivated. And we're not sure if we found it or it found us. Right, right. It goes anywhere. Right. So, you know, you have that, but you also, there is- I'm sorry, you just made, I'm, I'm not, this, this is quite so rude. I just had a moment when you said, when it, whether we found it or it found us, you know, particularly out of your neck of the woods where every season there's this, these fires, right? And I can imagine back in the day, a field of, of, uh, of cannabis, of marijuana just kind of burning. You know? it's, and, and little Kate man said, they go, why do I feel so good about this fire? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I mean, but you know, then they, they figured out. Oh, that's what this does. But no, it, go ahead. Make your point. I'm just sorry. I'm just being. Silly. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> but it was just it right. just occurred to me when you said that. That was like that was that was the first hot boxing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly okay so but no but it's but you know there is there is a obviously a very high level of seriousness around it you make a good point that you know some of the falsehoods is that you know it's not an industry that 
that's serious about the science. It's not studied. We still don't know what it will do uh, and, all, and all of these types of things. But we also know that there are there's some really good um, uh, narratives that can come out of this out of this product in terms of how it does help people and and those aren't myths that's real you can touch you and a lot of people know they they see it from their from their grandparents or a cousin or a relative or a friend who are using it people who um, know your story uh, and were part of that story know the impact you know it had on you so pe there are i guess my point is they're living examples real life examples that refute some of the falsehoods true absolutely absolutely and you know it can take some time for people to see it and understand it but if you're paying attention and you're seeing what people are doing i mean okay let's be honest there will always be bad players in any sure moment. yeah yeah but the majority of people who are working in cannabis are doing it because it's affected their lives significantly they or they're just fascinated by it and they want to get involved in something new and different mm -hmm you know, or they're looking at the fact of how much prosperity it can bring. The green rush is over, straight up. That's Thank you, I on. agree. So tell, tell folks what that is. So you're not gonna go into cannabis and make a ton of money, you're not. And if you're investing in cannabis, you better be looking at the long game. Don't invest in it and a year later ask where my money is. <laughs> I actually had that conversation recently with someone <laughs> like, I'm sorry, bro. You should have should have read the, it wasn't fine print. It was bold print, but go ahead. You, you make a, a good point. People have this notion to just come in and, and, you know, six months later, I'm going to be a gazillionaire. Yeah. It's not, if you wanted to do that, you should have gone in when it was going for, you know, 3,500 a pound when you were worried about the feds coming in. Right. And that's when you should have done it if you were looking at a green rush, because the reason that we made so much money back then was that there was a lot of risk. Now we're looking at taxation, like in California, we have all these beautiful taxes. Mm -hmm. and now we have a glut of cannabis that's going for lower and lower and people aren't making money and they're starting to close their businesses. We're looking at major extinction events we have for the past three years. Really? So it's, it's progressed that much? Um, yeah. from from uh, the early days. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, you know, because we have, and, and it's good. We need to have a foundation. We need to have rules around testing. We need to have rules around packaging. Although I think that, you know, it's excessive and it's kind of everyone proof. Right. Um, Is that sort know, of the normalization of the market? Would you say that's kind of the normalization of the, of, of the cannabis market? Guess what? We're now big boys and girls. We're, you know, we're we're competing with the Wall Streeters and and the Main Streeters. So we're we're kind of in that space. Yeah. Well, but you know, I mean, here's the thing too, Michael. I've yet to see a childproof cap on a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Fair you know. Point. And and honestly, if we really want to get to brass tacks about it, nobody, you know, nobody smokes a joint and goes home and beats their kids. Yeah. Yeah. It, they they don't it, fact <laughs> i mean if anything i've ha i've heard people say it's a tool for me to like be able to handle everything everything so you i know? don't i don't go home and 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 act out on on the family no it it there are, it, those are some of the dynamics about it that that are very fascinating to me in terms of how people process their their move into cannabis you know i have friends who've used it since we were in high school together. Uh, I have other friends like myself who've never used it, but are very strong advocates and supporters of it because we understand the science, we understand the history um, and we know, and, and I value more than anything else. So for me, the medicinal side of it, for me, the recreational piece is like, okay, y'all yeah. Yeah, been recreating forever, that's great, but the more important thing is the medicinal side and the impact I know for my own family members who suffer from ailments that uh, are helped by uh, by CR uh, by um, cannabis. Um, so the 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 reality is um, 
it's it's a very different reality now. I think, and you make the point so well. For those who are looking at this, it really is becoming well. No, it is an industry, and as all industries, it is now settled into that space where markets are created, markets decline, markets go away, and that's what you're seeing playing out right now. Yeah, and you're seeing you're seeing a lot of MSOs coming into play. Mm -hmm. um you're but i also think that there's room and there should be space for small producers that do artisan products you know because there is there's such you know we're getting some standardization of it which is good and bad right because you know it's like years ago i had some i was in a a, a research call where they were asking me that this company had a big pharma client and they said do you think, and this was when we were in medical days, your patients would be okay with, you know, cannabis from big pharma? And I said, yes and no, because there are some people who look at that as like the institutionalization of cannabis. Like, okay, this is good. Like, like when, uh, you know, when Gupta was on CNN with right. around cannabis, I had this woman who's in her 90s call me she's like well, dr gupta says it's okay i'm gonna come in and check it out <laughs> great it's right. the conversation right but the thing that people need to know is that a lot of people use cannabis medicinally as an active choice against big pharma because they've had such bad experiences or right. the side effects they haven't gotten what they needed and I, that's not to say that there isn't i am i'm a i don't think that we should be looking at getting rid of traditional medicine right 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 but the, but there but there's some real concerns and one of them being addiction it's a big concern for a lot of folks who do not want to become addicted to certain uh you know opioids opioids or um other types of medicines that are are largely pushed by pharmaceutical companies I and mean, we I, this is not, folks, this is not Michael and Sarah saying this, just turn on your damn television. <laughs> and my favorite part in those, those commercials is when they start going through all the shit that's going to make you sick, die, crazy, whatever, and yet they're still pushing that. Um, and, and so what I, what I am curious about is how the industry kind of um, continues to evolve in this space not fall into some of the traps that we've seen some other industries fall into in terms of um, at coming out of the gate, which begs the question, when you look at what we're doing here in the United States, how do we compare to other countries around the globe? Um, now we know some have really hard and fast laws against marijuana, et cetera, but in the space where cannabis, like we see here in the US has, has and is establishing markets starting to be regulated where are we comparatively well i think first we have to have a real discussion about the fact that the reason that cannabis has so much stigma in other countries is because of the work that we did around that we did a lot of pr work around that policy-wise pressuring countries to make cannabis illegal mm -hmm. and it's really interesting to see how things are opening up like if you look at thailand there's it's opening up they're starting to look at the idea of cannabis tourism they actually have a lot of projects going on with hemp but then alternatively look at amsterdam um you know which Netflix. which is sort of the quintessential <laughs> playground for cannabis right but it, that's changing because the netherlands several years ago they used to have it where medicinal cannabis could be covered by certain insurances and they stopped that and now they're looking at making it so that people who visit the country can't go to the coffee houses. So they're actually kind of going backwards in their policy. Interesting, interesting. So, you know, we have a, it's, it's very different with the way things are going. But the one thing that I've noticed like in places like Portugal where they've decriminalized you know, drug use and cannabis being included in that mm -hmm. is that they're having a much easier time dealing with addiction and, you know, we need to be having conversations in general when we're looking at substances that are addictive about harm reduction and the stigma around addiction. Because a lot of times the reason that people have a hard time and have bad relationships with substances is because of shame and the lack of support. 
you know. Yeah. How, what, how does your work uh, touch on that? What, what are you doing, um, particularly given your own personal experience in that regard? I've worked with a lot of people to help them uh, curb and end their opiate use. Um, you know, I'm not a medical professional by right. any stretch of the imagination, right. but I make recommendations for things for people to try. So, you know, I've actually helped people with that have had issues with heroin, with speed, with cocaine. Mm -hmm. As human beings, we're constantly subconsciously striving for homeostasis. Our thermostats might be a little off and we go right. beyond what it is that we need. But, you know, the reality is you can have a bad relationship with anything. Like when people say cannabis isn't addictive, well, it's not physically addictive, but we can become psychologically addicted. Right, to right. So like several years ago, I had a gentleman who came into the dispensary with a syringe of cannabis concentrate. And he said, I've been smoking this to get myself off of hard drugs and it's not working anymore. And he just gave me this really hard stare. And that's when I looked at him and I said, this is another conversation that you have to have. What are you trying to, what hole are you trying to fill? Because this substance on its own starts the process. Right. Now we have to look at what else do you have to take out of your toolbox to get yourself into a healthy state? Is it therapy? Is it working with a physician on other modalities of therapies? What's going on? Because there is no one single thing that's going to cure everything. And as much as some of my colleagues will say that cannabis is that, it is not. It does a lot of great things, but we mm -hmm. have to be realistic about what it can and can't do. And that's why I like talking to Sarah, folks, because she's realistic about uh, this industry and its product and its people and how all of that works together or could not work together if we if we get it wrong. And, and so, Sarah, I really appreciate your your stopping by to spend a little bit of time to talk about this and to uh, further elevate the conversation and engage, uh, you know, my friends on this podcast um, in, in this conversation in a way that maybe having learned or heard something they didn't know before is always important. It's always a good lesson. And every time we chat, I, I, I pick up and learn a little bit more. So I'm really, really grateful for that. And, and the leadership of your words and experience in, in this area, which is so important um, coming at it the way you do. So thank you. Thank you. I, I think it's really important to talk with, you know, everybody who is making policy to really get them to understand what it can and can't do and the reality of it and cut through all the stigma that is informing a lot of this policy that not only, you know, goes against prosperity, but actually can harm people in the industry. Um, and I also think that it's a really good time to get people talking about if you don't like the prices in your state, if you don't like the policies, it's time to come out of the cannabis closet. It's time to let your policymakers know, you know you're a highly functioning member of society that contributes. You use cannabis and you vote. Bingo. <laughs> and that last one is the thing that will get their attention more than anything else. <laughs> the fact that you vote. <laughs> no, it, it makes it such a good point. Um, uh, Sarah Payne, she is she is uh, she's a real treat uh, to learn from uh, and to watch her do her work in the cannabis space. She is um, uh, a leading uh, an award winning um, educator and activist. Uh, for medical cannabis um, and a, a real strong voice in the movement and normalizing cannabis for, for use in health. And we really appreciate you taking a time to be with us. You can follow her on Twitter um, at Sarah M as in Mary, Payan, uh, P-A-Y-A-N. Um, and check out her podcast, folks, again, to further the conversation and to continue to learn um, a little bit more about what's happening in this space, check out Plant It with Sarah Payan. Um, it's a great podcast. I've had the privilege of being a part of it. Um, and I think you would get a lot out of it. So again, um, that's what we like uh, here in this neck of the woods is to inform, educate, uh, and engage. And you brought all of that today, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Michael. It's always a pleasure hanging out with you. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. And we didn't even smoke a joint. Um, so 
<laughs> I know my I know my audience go. I got to go to the videotape and see if this brother's smoking over there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, it's all good. So, folks, I really again appreciate you when you when you spend some time with us. You can find us on the Spreaker app, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, wherever you get your podcast on. Please, if you like this episode, comment on the Spreaker app. It helps me know your thoughts and to bring some better conversations to you as we continue to grow uh, and engage um, here at the Michael Steele podcast. Until next time, be safe, be well. Um, spring is here, baby. Masks are coming off. Mandates are going well, going away. It's a time for us to re-engage uh, with one another uh, and our humanity for and with each other. So enjoy until next time. I'm Michael Steele. <laughs>